My name is Matt Stafford, and for the last 15 years, I've taught a course in the Book of Psalms at Ozark Christian College. I'm excited to do this study in the Psalms with you, where we're going to get an overview of the entire Book of Psalms, uh, focusing in on several of them to give us an example of the breadth of the different genres and types of prayers and songs that we find in the book. The Book of Psalms is very important for the Christian because the Book of Psalms teach us how to pray. When Jesus was asked by his disciples to be taught to pray, he gave them an example, our Father who art in heaven. In the same way, the Psalms are examples for us of how to pray, the language, the attitude, the postures of prayer and worship that we need to embrace as well. Now, when you begin to pray or read or study through the Psalms, one of the things you notice is that there are actually five books of Psalms. The collection of Psalms is divided into five books, books one and two, are largely prayers of David. Uh, these are very biographical. They come out of very personal experiences in his life. And uh, so often there are experiences that you might have uh, that are similar to what David had. David, uh, while he was a great leader, also had his own faults and failures and difficulties and challenges. And I think these Psalms uh, give us uh, prayers to pray when we're in the midst of the battle or when we're lonely, lost, hurting, wounded, betrayed. Uh, there's a psalm very much that we can identify with in those psalms. The next group of psalms is in book three, that's Psalm 73 through 89. Now, these psalms were very likely compiled during the exile. This is when the Jewish people were carried away into captivity in Babylon, and they had some very serious questions of God. God, why did you allow this to happen? Why did your, your temple uh, where you dwelt, why did that fall before the Babylonians? Where were you? Uh, and God, you made promises to us. You made promises to Abraham that we would have a, a, a huge nation and that David's descendants would always reign on the throne, and, and yet we don't see this happening. So these Psalms help us process those big questions of life. When God seems to be distant, when God seems to have failed us, uh, these Psalms give us the words to say to process those experiences. The last group, books four and five, are largely songs of, of celebration. Uh, they were probably collected following uh, the exile, the return back to the land, the temple has been rebuilt, worship is restored, and these songs celebrate the sovereignty of God and the salvation of God. Uh, they're great psalms for, uh, for corporate worship. So if you're a worship leader, I think you'll find a lot of psalms in those two books to be very helpful in planning and leading worship as they lead us to think about what God has done through salvation history, and particularly they point us uh, to Jesus. So that's a quick overview of the entire collection. What I wanna do now is to zoom in on Psalm 1, and we're going to look at the characteristics of Hebrew poetry as uh, we see them in this very first psalm. Now, the most dominant feature of Hebrew poetry is parallelism. Parallelism is essentially a correspondence. Usually it's a correspondence between two lines of poetry. There's a line and the next line is very similar to it in some way. Sometimes it's uh, contrastive and sometimes it just adds a little more information. But parallelism has this effect of slowing us down. Uh, because it makes us ask the question, now why is that second line a little different than the first? What is what is happening here? What's What additional information is being added or what contrast is being made? So it slows us down, which is a good thing. We need to slow down and meditate and reflect and contemplate each of these Psalms, I think, word by word, and parallelism helps us to do that. Uh, parallelism may also help us with memory because if the second line is similar to the first, it can be a, a way to jog our memory into what that second line is. Uh, given that the Psalms were given to a largely illiterate uh, population uh, historically, uh, there's a good reason to think that parallelism assists with memory. And, and finally, parallelism means that Hebrew poetry can be translated in any language without a loss uh, of meaning. Uh, oftentimes, poetry is dependent on the sound of words, uh, but in this case, uh, the poetry is based on the meaning of words, and those can be translated. And so it makes Hebrew poetry really a universal language. Uh, so that's an important factor of Hebrew poetry. We see it in play in the very first verse of the very first Psalm. Psalm 1 begins with this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Walk 
stand, sit. We have three parallel actions, three postures, if you will, uh, in the counsel of the wicked, in the way of sinners, in the seat of scoffers. Those are three places with three groups of people. And so we might uh, break that down and think about each one of those. And what is the difference between walking, uh, that is a behavior, a lifestyle, or, or standing where we might take a firm position on something, or, or sitting where we are, are so set in our ways, we are comfortable with this position. And so, and so parallelism forces us to ask those questions and relate the, each of those lines to one another. And essentially what the psalmist is saying is if you want to live a blessed life, a good life in God's eyes, then be careful with your associations, with those forces in our culture or surroundings that might influence us and move us from a standing to a sitting, uh, to a sitting position. The next verse, verse 2, corresponds with the first verse. It continues by saying, in contrast, uh, the blessed person's delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and on his law he meditates day and night. Delight and meditate, those two correspond to one another. That's parallel. And the idea of meditation, of course, is to reflect deeply on something. Uh, delight by meditating is the connection there. Uh, meditation, literally in the Hebrew, is the word haga, and it means to mutter or to mumble, sometimes to groan, or even have a lion growling over its prayer, over its prey. Uh, so what this means is that we're to speak the word of God out loud, uh, to memorize it, to recite it, to say it to ourselves um, over and over again throughout the day. In doing so, we, we chew on it, we reflect on its meaning. Years ago, I heard an illustration for this that really captures it well. Uh, cows chew the cud. That is, they, they eat the, the, their food and they chew it and then they swallow it and they regurgitate it and they chew it some more, swallow it, regurgitate it continually. Um, and this is a similar picture of what meditation is. It is chewing on the word of God, taking it in, bringing it back up later to chew on it even more and reflect on it and think upon it uh, so that we are lingering on it and getting every bit of meaning and truth out of it so that it actually becomes part of us, just as the food that we eat becomes part of us. Uh, the next two verses give us uh, a second characteristic of Hebrew poetry, and that is imagery, metaphor, uh, simile, hyperbole. Uh, these word pictures uh, that, again, ask us to linger and to stop and look and consider and look at it from different perspectives. In this case, there are two images. There is the image of a tree and the image of chaff. There's a lot more words spent on the tree. It's described in four lines. It says that the tree uh, is like a tree that's planted by streams of water. So we focus on the roots. This is a, a person who is deeply attached to, to the word of God. I think the, the word of God corresponds to the waters between verse two and verse three. And, and, and the roots go deep and wide, and they draw up that nourishment and strength and life from the word of God. They're rooted. It goes on to describe the tree as fruitful in season. So the tree is also fruited. Uh, and this, that fruit then provides nourishment to other people. It provides a sweetness uh, to those that are around this person. Uh, fruit is also the way that trees propagate themselves. And so it allows this tree to reproduce itself in others. So you're, you're seeing this imagery, this, uh, this metaphor has many different aspects to it. The longer we linger on it, the more of those perhaps that we will see. The third description of this tree is that its leaf doesn't wither. So there's a constancy uh, to this tree, no matter what environment it is in. Even if that environment is very harsh and dry, this tree will remain fresh and green because it's attached to the water, to the word of God that is drying up. And finally, it says that in all that he does, he will prosper. This tree is going to grow. It's inherent in the nature of a tree to grow. If it has the ingredients, it will grow. And the same is true of our spiritual lives. If we're attached to the word of God, we will grow. It's part of our nature. A tree uh, will bear fruit if it is attached uh, to the source of life, which is the word of God. So we have this beautiful picture of, of a tree. Contrasting with that, we find in verse 4 is the picture of chaff. Now, chaff is everything that a tree is not. The chaff was the byproduct, the waste that came from the harvest. It was the shell uh, that went around the grain. So the grain was, uh, was beaten, the shell broke loose, 
All of it was tossed up in the air. The wind blew the lightweight chaff away, leaving the good grain to fall. And that chaff was seen as worthless. And so the psalmist says, not so the wicked, they're like the chaff that the wind blows away. Just one single line that describes the hollowness, the shallowness, the emptiness of a life that's unattached to the word of God, a life that, that has no life in it because it's not attached uh, to those streams of water. Uh, and so it's, a, it's two pictures for us, a contrasting picture, a tree and chaff. This brings us to our, our final element of Hebrew poetry. And sometimes in Hebrew poetry, we will see chiasm. We'll see a chiasm. And this is usually seen as an ABA type relationship. So you have an A part of the psalm, a B part that's another meaning, another picture, and then we'll return to the, the A part. Well, that's what we have in Psalm 1. If you look at verses 5 and 6, it says, Therefore, the wicked won't stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And in verses 4 and 5, we have some of the same words and images that we have in verse 1. So that's that A part coming back uh, to complete it, to, to complete the picture. And so what this does for us is really present a picture for us with a frame. The A part, the verse 1, verse 4 and 5, those are the frames. And then the pictures are in the center, the tree and the chaff. And the psalmist would have us look at those two pictures and make a choice. Which will it be? Will you stay attached, rooted, so that you can bear fruit, so that you can be constant, so that you can grow? Or will you be unattached to the word and instead be shaped by the culture around you and become empty, hollow, lifeless, like the chaff? This psalm presents a choice for us. It's fascinating that it's the very first of the psalms, and it's not really a prayer, is it? It's instruction. It is a call to make a decision to choose. Where will you find your source of life, of truth, of reality? Make your choice wisely, the psalmist says. And if you do so, the Lord will watch over you and you will be blessed. You will live a life well. <music>